Yeah, welcome everyone for High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today is an invited lecture by one of, a, of my PhD student, Shadi Barakat, who is an health expert, and he will talk a little bit about his application in this particular Lecture 11. So Shadi, take it from here. Thanks, Morris. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Shadi Barakat. I'm currently doing my PhD at uh, the University of Iceland. And also it's in cooperation with um, uh, Forschungszentrum Jülich and the uh, Simulation Data Lab Health and Medicine in Iceland, but also several university hospitals in, uh, in Germany, which we'll get to talk about in a bit. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that Morris asked me to join today to talk about what kind of work I'm doing in terms of applying HPC in medical applications. So uh, let's, um, let's move on with the lecture and see, uh, hopefully that I can share some of the expertise that I'm developing in the field with you and maybe encourage you to join us in the medical field. So uh, with that, let's start the lecture. Um, in the last lecture that uh, you had, I think it was uh, with Rocco, he talked about uh, ResNet 50 architecture and using deep learning with HPC and uh, applications of ResNet 50. And um, in our lecture, we're going to mention something similar to ResNet 50 in terms of applications of it in the medical field. And also uh, Rocco mentioned using the Jewel system, which is currently the fastest supercomputer in Europe. And that's, um, that's also some, one part of the cluster that we're using in the medical applications. Um, Rocco also mentioned the applications of Horovod, which are specific for his applications, and uh, also distributed training of the Horovod uh, algorithm. In our case, we're going to be applying different types of algorithms, but at the same time, this is something that's uh, specifically for medical. And uh, of course, everyone's going to talk about the kind of protocols that are specific to their applications. So um, eventually, when you move on with your research, you'll have to get acquainted with the kind of uh, hardware and software that you need for your kind of work. But it's a good example to see uh, different applications while you're also studying about this kind of thing. So since we're done with the review, uh, let's go into the details of the kind of work that we're doing. So uh, as you as you probably have, uh, have guessed, this is an application of health and neurosciences in HPC, and as well HPC in health and neurosciences. So uh, to go more into details, we have to talk about a lot of things, but before we do all of that, we have to kind of talk about how we're having access to these HPC resources. And uh, as you probably have already seen, HPC is kind of big and uh, as a beginning, as a beginner into this, it feels a bit scary. But eventually you realize that uh, this stuff is needed for a lot of applications. And uh, so it, it kind of helps a lot when access to these resources is made easier. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is how access to this resource can be done and how it can be simplified because sometimes the people who need access to it aren't people who know how to do batch scripts, aren't people who, who know how to code. So um, let's start with this part and then we move on to applications in healthcare and then applications in neuroscience. So in our kind of applications, we are accessing HPC resources at the Forschungszentrum Jülich. The, uh, specifically at the Forschungszentrum Jülich, we have access to the Jülich Supercomputing Center. And in that uh, Supercomputing Center, we have access to several clusters. But to get access, we have to create an account through an, uh, a platform called Udor, which also governs the kind of budgets that every group has access to within the HPC. But specifically, Access to Udor grants the, uh, the user access to a JupyterLab implementation. If you don't know what JupyterLab is, it's mostly a browser-based implementation of a developing environment. 
you can use a lot of uh, you can do a lot of programming on Jupyter, but mostly we use it for Python. But there's also Julia, there's also Octave, which is a MATLAB implementation, or at least MATLAB similar because MATLAB is kind of very closed in. And um, the good thing about this is that it's browser-based and it doesn't require a lot of uh, up and down um, on the on SSH. It doesn't require a lot of access through terminal and doesn't require almost any knowledge of terminal uh, terminal codes. But also specifically in this implementation, which is Jupyter at JSC, as you can see here, uh, the uh, these resources have an expandable hardware model where you can, as you can see in the picture here, select how many nodes you need and how long you need them for. But also you can select which partition and which part of the project that you're in. Uh, you can also use the pre-installed machine learning modules, which can range from uh, specific MPI packages to specific versions of TensorFlow or Python or uh, Keras, which is also a deep learning uh, module. And you have access to a lot of storage, specifically on the cluster. So with that, we move on to the specific description of the hardware that we're using. I'm not going to go into the details of the dual system, but mostly I'm going to talk about the deep system, which has um, 16 nodes, each of which has 24 cores, and then each of which has also GPU nodes and uh, a crazy amount of storage. But specifically, we need to talk about the applications of memory, which is like the uh, RAM on this cluster for each node, because this specific module was for data analytics and specifically for image data analytics. So the kind of work that Rocco was uh, mentioning last week or in the last session, which is the application of uh, hyperspectral images. So uh, these kind of applications require a lot of storage because a lot of image data has to be loaded onto the clusters before being processed. And uh, these GPUs have make it a lot easier to process large scale data. And that's why this system is especially useful in these kind of applications, but also in medical applications as we're going to see. So specifically, uh, I mentioned super, uh, supercomputing at Ulish, but we're also part of the IHPC community, which is the Icelandic high performance computing community. And for me specifically, I'm, uh, I'm with Morris as well in the simulation and data science lab for health and medicine. And uh, these applications kind of uh, introduce um, the Icelandic community to HPC. And uh, this is something that's specifically necessary for Iceland, but also Iceland is kind of, um, it's making this kind of, um, very uh, positive environment for these applications and it's a uh, if uh, i mean i hope morris can correct me on this but it's uh, also uh, it has a lot of cooperation with the uh, clinic the landspitalen and this uh, this kind of cooperation and access to the data that's available from the hospital would benefit the uh, the health community as well as the hpc community in iceland so now let's move on to the application of HPC in healthcare. So as you already know, there's a lot of different types of data and uh, you've already seen the hyperspectral data that Rocco was talking about, and these are image data. And there's also like the more simple image data as you can see here in the MNIST data set. And this kind of data is, uh, two-dimensional data, which is the X and Y axis for each image, but there's also a Z axis, which is the color. So in hyperspectral data, you have several uh, layers in the Z dimension, making this data multi-dimensional. And the uh, MNIST dataset is a three-dimensional image data, but we also have different types of data, which are sequence data. For example, speech, 
as we are talking right now, this speech is a sequence data where what comes next depends a lot on what comes before it. Similarly, uh, written text is a kind of sequence data as well as medical signals. What's different about medical signals is that it has it's many different waveforms running at the same time. And each of them conveys specific information and each of these uh, specific information separately has inherent meaning. So um, what the kind of networks and machine learning approaches that work properly on hyperspectral data, on image data, may not be adequate to be able to run on speech or medical signals, because some of them are adapted for the uh, X and Y um, X and Y application of an image, but it may not be able to pick up on the subtleties of the speech waveform, for example. It may not be able to work on uh, speech recognition or understanding. So uh, specific machine learning approaches have been developed to take advantage of each type of data. And that's, uh, that's how the deep learning and machine learning field is expanding and mostly expanding and become more specific to each region of data. So as we already, as you already have seen, convolutional neural networks are specifically um, designed for to process images, and they're very good at that. But they may not be very good for a uh, for sequence data because they don't take into consideration past versions of this data. They only see the data itself. So uh, for to, to to resolve this problem research has been done into developing RNNs, which are recurrent neural networks. These networks have the same kind of concept of input and output, but they also hold a memory aspect, which is the previous value that is outputted by this model that is fed into the next step of the model. So what they, what they do is that they exploit, as, you can, as, as we mentioned here, is that they exploit the sequential nature of the inputs. So um, these RNNs are used to create sequence models and the occurrence of an element in the sequence is dependent on the elements that appeared before it. So for example, uh, as I'm talking right now, this every word itself has a specific meaning, but these words together, they have a different meaning. They might have a completely opposite meaning to what I'm, I'm saying or to the specific words themselves. Sometimes negation changes the meaning of a sentence, but the word itself might be a positive word. And this is the same, this is what makes RNNs specific and effective because it's because they take into consideration the history and the general meaning of the sentence itself. So there are different types of recurrent neural networks and they've evolved with time. Um, the initial model of an RNN was very basic, where here you have an input and an output and a history element. And that history element is given, is fed back into another, uh, uh, another part of the recurrent neural network. Um, this model evolved into something called an LSTM, which is long short-term memory module. This model has more activation functions, as you can see here, which are the 10H parts. These parts are activation functions that affect the data as it's being fed into the network. It has several gates as well, and several, um, several uh, calculations being done with the data itself within the modules. And this LSTM eventually evolved into something called a gated recurrent unit, which is mentioned here, which is a bit less complex, but still uh, does the same kind of work. I mean, there was some, there was um, some kind of, we had to let go of one thing to be able to do another thing. And in this case, GRUs were developed to be less complex. So their uh, results might be a bit less effective than LSTMs, but at least they weren't as computationally expensive as LSTMs. So to each network, there is a specific application. One network would be specific, would be effective in one application, but not another. So again, more knowledge about this affects 
when this one is applied. So we go further into details of LSTMs and GRUs. So uh, as, as is mentioned here, LSTMs are a special kind of recurrent neural networks that take long-term dependencies in data, and they remember information for long periods of time. The data in the LSTM memory cell flows straight down the chain with some linear interactions, multiplications, and additions. And um, they have three different kinds of gates within the structure that control the cell state. Gated recurrent, neuro, uh, gated recurrent units are a similar version of LSTMs, but they're also similar. Uh, they're also simpler. They offer comparable performance, but with a reduced computational cost. And in this, in this case, we mentioned comparable, but it might not, it might be comparable in some applications, but not in others. So uh, you hold on to the fact that sometimes LSTMs are the only way to go. And sometimes GRUs are just as effective, maybe more effective because they reduce like with uh, they have a reduced computational cost so real world data sets for example medical time series they come in a lot of shapes they come in different uh, types of waveforms and they come also in different different values in different ranges and you have to take into consideration that it might not be clean it might not be perfect and you have to deal with that. But at the same time, all of these, what they have in common is that they are all uh, sequence data. So sequence data by definition means that the order of the data is important. The future values depend greatly on past values and current values, but also they depend greatly on inputs, including, for example, if you take into consideration drugs being input to the patient, um, sudden changes in their environments, maybe let's say cardiac arrest, if it happens, it affects the other parts of the body. And uh, also the treatment that the doctors offer, they also affect the cardiac rate or the breathing rate or other parts of the body. So all of this has to be taken into consideration if you're trying to develop a model that, for example, predicts mortality or predicts the next step or tries to provide treatment applications, sorry, for this specific patient. So um, to be able to, anal to analyze all of these time series, you have to develop a model that at the same time is able to take into consideration the long time series, but also the multiple time series. This has become uh, more and more easy right now because Digitization made it possible to store this data in, um, in uh, electronic health records and to build large databases full of information. One example of this data uh, being stored in large databases is the MIMIC database, the medical, um, medical information mart for applications in ICU. This is a, a database of medical health records from a lot of, from about 44,000 patients in Minnesota, if I remember correctly. And this data is available freely for everyone who is doing research in data science in medical fields. And um, similar application, similar databases exist for use. Some of them are closed and some of them are open and all of them can be mined to develop diagnosis and treatment methods. And this is one of the specific applications that we are working on. But before we talk about that, we should talk as well about respiratory disease, which is one specific, which is also part of the specific application that we're working on. So specifically about medical, about respiratory disease is that it affects every part of the body at the same time. When you have reduced breathing, you have an increase of carbon dioxide in the blood. This increase causes something called blood acidosis, which causes a wide ranging um, effect. One of them is reduced heart rate. Sometimes it's increased heart rate, depends on how much the acidosis is extreme. Uh, other effects include uh, multi-organ failure. Some organs begin to shut down. 
Sometimes blood pressure increases, sometimes it drops, it depends on the state of the patient. And uh, all of these are subtle effects to this kind of, uh, to this reduction in oxygen in the blood. They're very subtle effects, but at the same time, they have a why they, they might have a devastating effect on the patient themselves. And uh, this kind of respiratory disease can be caused by several types of conditions. So in the, in the corner here, we talk about respiratory disease being mostly four types. There can be more, but these are the four major factors. It could be obstructive lung disease where parts of the lungs do not work anymore. It could be a restrictive lung disease where the lungs don't expand enough. It could be outside pressure and could be inside pressure in the, uh, for the lungs. It could be due to chronic respiratory disease where the lungs are inflamed for a long time and repetitively, and that would reduce the ability of the patient to breathe. And it could be a respiratory tract infection, which is infections outside of the lungs, but within the, uh, within the body. So it could be from the nose all the way down to the bronx, um, to the bronchiae, I forgot the name. But so uh, if you probably heard about bronchitis or laryngitis, all of this could be considered a respiratory tract infection. And if not uh, controlled properly, it could cause um, a pneumonia, which eventually stops the patient from being able to breathe. So uh, this is an example, like for example, respiratory tract infections are usually bacterial based. And uh, this is a bacterial infection that causes a respiratory disease as we mentioned here. Viral infections, for example, we've all heard about this and have been affected by it. COVID-19 is one of them. Trauma, for example, that causes respiratory disease would be a car accident that causes um, a crushed chest, or it could be just a broken rib that pierces the lungs. In this case, you have a complete reduction of pressure within the lungs and the patient can't breathe anymore. So a lot of things can cause respiratory disease but the final result is the same. The patient is sick and we need to find a way to fix it. So treatment usually begins with mechanical ventilation, but that's also stressful because if you've already seen how mechanical ventilation works, it's forcing air into the lungs. And that force itself could cause further injury. So usually, this is a kind of last resort, but at the same time, it's necessary. So there's a kind of very thin line that staff have to, that medical staff have to work on, which is try to give as much care as possible without causing more damage. And the protocols that ICU staff use to do this is usually very dependent on the hospital itself. So, which is usually a generally accepted uh, protocols for each hospital. And it could uh, differ from one hospital to another. It could differ from one doctor to another within the same hospital. So all of this affects how the, the treatment is done. All of this affects how the patient is, uh, uh, is evolving with time and with their disease. And what we are trying to do, and then as we will mention later, is to kind of provide a protocol that is applicable everywhere. But this protocol will be developed using AI. So specifically, we're talking about SMITH and ARDS. SMITH is the Smart Medical Information Technology for Healthcare project. It's based in Germany, and it involves the main, uh, some of the largest uh, clinics in Germany, the university clinics. And also it involves the uh, research institutions at, uh, for example, at Forschungszentrum Jülich, which, was, which is our part in this project. And specifically in Smith, we're working on fighting ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a rare condition that affects ICU patients. It doesn't affect many patients, but when it does affect them, it has a very high mortality rate, about 40 to 
And this is specifically, uh, it's the specific condition where the patient's lungs start to fill up with water due to mechanical ventilation injury. So there is a lot of consensus about what the disease is, but there is not a lot of consensus of, about where it begins or how to treat it. Um, Morris often compares this to the doctors going like, uh, now is the time to treat, now is not the time. And this is a problem because not having an exact protocol for this disease means that it's not being diagnosed at the right time. And early diagnosis is usually the key to solving the, the disease. So uh, what we are trying to do is to develop an algorithm that can efficiently and effectively diagnose this disease and hopefully at some point provide treatment methods or recommendations. To do that, we have to get access to data and from that data develop a mechanistic model that takes all of this input and tries to see what the tiny changes to this data causes to the output. When this is done, we feed all of this information into another model that creates simulations. And from that model, we try to um, export the data to train a numer another numerical model that would be um, exported and given to hospital ICUs. And in that case, this in, the, in that model, they would feed a current patient's information or current patient's diagnosis, and it would output, for example, if this patient has ARDS, and it would output also what are the mitigating factors to reduce this disease. But to be able to, to do all of this, you have to have access to a lot of computing power. And this is exactly where HPC resources come into play. And this specifically is the part where we are involved. As you can see here, we have the patient data being fed into the uh, algorithmic surveillance of ICU patients model. This predictive model is made up of the DEA, which is the diagnostic expert advisor, which gives the advice. And it's also being fed into the virtual patient, which is a simulation that will run on HPC and export the uh, parameters. And from this model, we can do a prognosis for each individual patient based on their specific inputs. Similarly, another use case that we're also working on and I'm, uh, I'm currently working on this in parallel, mostly one of your colleagues is working on this and I'm working in parallel with him. Um, he's a master's student at the University of Iceland and currently pr presenting his thesis, uh, Gisli. Uh, so his work is on image processing using HPC and it's for combating the COVID-19 pandemic. His kind of work applies a convolution, convolutional neural network uh, this one is similar to the ResNet 50 that you saw in the last lecture, but it's called COVID-Net. And uh, this specific network is trained on a database of chest X-ray images. These chest X-ray images are collected from all over the world. Some of them are for healthy patients. Some of them are from pneumonia patients, but this pneumonia is caused by other viruses or by bacteria and also trained on COVID-19 patients. So this network effectively tells the difference between the lungs of healthy patients, pneumonia patients, and COVID-19 patients. In Gisli's application, uh, they try to implement this network to, uh, to new data. And we'll get to that in a second, but mostly the researchers who developed this network uh, try to compare it to ResNet 50 and another VGG19, which is another um, large scale convolutional neural network. And they highlighted that it was, it was more effective at detecting COVID-19 in these chest X-ray images. So in Giesley's work, what he's doing is taking the network that is trained on different data and giving it new data from um, eHealthline in our case. eHealthline is a business partner for us and they have a large scale, large-ish scale uh, access to uh, X-ray images, and what uh, what we are doing 
is that we are feeding new data into a network that is trained on old data. And this aspect itself is called transfer learning, which is applying a pre-trained network to a new problem that has new data, but it's slightly similar to the old application. And in, in his case, uh, I think Gizli had a lot of positive results in this, and hopefully we can take this project to the next step for uh, applications in actual hospitals. But to do all of this, we had to do the training on the deep cluster. And uh, we just got news right now that we also have access to the Jewels cluster, which is currently, as I mentioned before, the fastest supercomputer in Europe. So uh, you can imagine how much we can expand this application. So all of these are applications of HPC in healthcare. And it might not look like a lot, but it's actually helping because what this supercomputer is doing uh, in one second, for example, is what teams of scientists wouldn't have been able to do in years. And this is another example of applications of HPC. And we'll move on to, the, we'll switch to this video as soon as we can. I think I'll have to ex exit the presentation to be able to reach this application. And I'll play it. This is an application of HPC in simulation as well. Researchers in Japan use the supercomputer Fugaku to simulate how the novel coronavirus spreads. They looked at a case in which four people are sitting at a dining table and talking without masks on. When someone talks to the person seated in front of them, about 5% of droplets reach the person. When talking to the person sitting diagonally, only one-fourth the amount reach the person. But when looking sideways to talk to the person sitting side by side, more than 25% of droplets reach the person. Researchers also found that fewer droplets spread when the humidity is higher. In an office setting, 6% of cough droplets reached a facing person nearly 2 meters away at 30% humidity. The amount dropped to about 2% at 90% humidity. Researchers recommended the use of humidifiers and other measures to reduce the spread of droplets in the dry winter season. And with that, we get to the end of this part of the presentation. And uh, hopefully you'll join us for the second part. Okay, Shadi, well done. Thank you very much.